I was thinking about uh, that song, how often I find myself just going through the motions and singing and uh, put on the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So just for drill, I kind of on this happy Mother's Day, uh, how many of you have gone through, maybe in the last little while, a spirit of heaviness? Anybody? Wow. So, you know, there's a lot of that going around. And the interesting thing, you know, when the, the gospel talks about us being clothed with Christ, you know, when we're baptized, I mean, even that's a, another word picture of that being clothed with Christ. And we're to put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. I, I wonder how much often we just wallow in our heaviness. I mean, I find myself doing that. Don't you find yourself nursing that along? You know, you're looking at whatever's going on, and it's easy to feel down. It's easy to feel discouraged. And sometimes it just hits us right out of the blue, right? I mean, you, you know, no, the objective circumstances of life may not have changed, but, you know, we're just kind of heavy. Well, this morning, uh, on a day like Mother's Day, I suspect that there are some really, really mixed feelings that happen if we even stop to think about it you know, then that brings a lot of different kinds of emotions. You know, um, man, I just looking out over the, the, the congregation and seeing, you know, here Marvin's uh, wife is at home and having some challenges and, you know, Kelly leaves tomorrow but to go back to Egypt uh, with the grandkids and all, you know, and... Uh, so, you know, and we have mothers here, and Mother's Day brings a, just a, a lot of interesting emotions. Um, I've been gone for a couple weeks. I, had, I worked on the men's weekend two weeks ago here in the valley, and that was just an amazing time of God working in the lives of men. It really, uh, it's just, it's always amazing. And then last week I went down to Idaho for what their ladies weekend it was the same as our ladies weekend at the same time so man again seeing these stories and hearing some of the accounts of how mothers have impacted our lives sometimes very very positively sometimes very very negatively and I would imagine in this congregation this morning, there are those who have experienced, you know, kind of both sides of that. It's just, it's, it's interesting. So anyway, uh, I shared some of these thoughts last year, but as I was reflecting again, I thought, man, we need, often we need some reminders. And uh, so, you know, if it seems familiar to you, do the best you can with it. But uh, this business of motherhood Man, it is not easy. And you can just chat with Kelly if you'd like about how grandmotherhood, if you're having to step in as motherhood, is not all that easy either. Uh, you know, we've experienced, you know, kind of that challenge. Uh, under the best circumstances, motherhood is fantastic. Now, we don't live always under the finest and most wonderful aspects of motherhood. Uh, and, you know, last weekend with the ladies and, and with the men too, uh, the weekend before that, you know, but last weekend there are mothers at every level. There were a few young mothers uh, that were kind of, had kids at home, but it's an older community, so there were a lot of mothers whose kids have raised, been raised, and they're on their own. There were some mothers who had lost their children there. There was a, a lady there whose husband just passed away four months ago. And so, you know, one of the tasks that I was tasked with was preaching a little about marriage. And it's a little bit like preaching on motherhood. 
because every woman here is at a different place regarding that whole piece of motherhood and it's kind of an interesting challenge God's Word is for everybody in all places at all times but boy it has specific application different to us at each step along the way in our lives and you know some days we need to be encouraged and some days we want to shout we need to be brought back to earth some days you know life is dumping all over us and some days we're skippity doo dah you know and everything is good it the, the word of God is constant it's just that we need it at different levels so uh, you know regarding the general world population probably somewhere in the vicinity of half of the people in the world are of the uh, female persuasion and uh, almost every human being whether male or female is capable of generating offspring and lots choose to do that and you know most males in the world are perfectly happy to contribute to that uh, proposition most. <laughs> well there is that one guy somewhere in Indonesia that was not interested but I mean largely you know most people are willing to cooperate in that venture but for the ladies it's a lot more painful but it's still not unusual for them to have children and uh, I did a little research on Mother's Day and I found some interesting things uh, you know that Mother's Day was started in the early 1900s around 19 uh, Oh, five, a lady named Anna Jarvis wanted to honor her mother. So she, boy, she got into this business and she lobbied people and she talked to people and she buttonholed people. And there was a guy named John Wanamaker who owned a chain, apparently, of stores. And so he backed her. And in 1908, they organized the first Mother's Day. So 1908, think about it, we're talking 100 and you know 11 years ago or so and this guy in one of his stores started that in Philadelphia did a, mo a Mother's Day something and uh, by 1912 Wood Woodrow Wilson had kind of officially proclaimed it a Mother's Day uh, so but Anna Jarvis had in mind that this was a day just to honor mothers you know, you ought to take your mother to church, you know, spend some time with her as a family and all that kind of stuff. That was her original intent. And you wear a white carnation, and, and, you know, that was kind of what Anna Jarvis had in mind. Well, of course, since there are several hundred mothers in the world, you know, Mother's Day began to really catch on, and so people that make cards and sell candy and flowers right away man that began to catch on so Anna Jarvis began to really get disillusioned with the whole thing of Mother's Day she spent the last part of her life trying to get it off of the calendar you know because she was so disgusted that it had become so commercialized it's just an interesting dynamic the law of unintended consequences seems to always be operational and, you know, uh, it is referred to sometimes as Murphy's Law, you know, for those of that uh, background. Or, you know, we, we call it, uh, I don't know, whatever else we call it, you know what we call it. But, you know, it, but it is the result of the fall. It's the result of the fall of man in the garden. Creation itself works against us. So this law of unintended consequences, you go to solve one thing and it takes you 10 others and you forget by the end of the day the one you were starting out to do because while you're starting to do this, you had to do that and then you had to do the other thing and then you had to do the other thing in order to do that other thing. And before long, you've been running like crazy all day and still haven't got around to whatever task you started out to do. I mean, it happens to all of us, right? Uh, from time to time. So... Uh, it's an interesting challenge as a pastor to know how to take these holidays and preach because there are so many diverse things at each level and each of us is going through things at a different level so and I and I don't want to baptize or Christianize every 
thing that comes along. But at the same time, when the whole culture is celebrating certain things, I don't want to miss the opportunity to key in on aspects of the gospel to touch on it. So it's just personally, it's kind of an interesting challenge. So to honor mothers and their sacrifices, almost every mother, uh, certainly those that are good mothers, sacrifice continually for their children. And uh, I, I personally have just been amazingly blessed in my family uh, and, and the family that I married into with mothers. Man, I, my mom was a godly woman. Her mom was a godly woman. Her mom was a godly woman, you know, so I don't know how far back it goes. On my dad's side, uh, his mom was a godly woman. And, you know, and then I married Rena. And so, you know, her mother and her sisters actually led her grandparents essentially to the Lord. And so Leah's mom, Virginia, and I mean, almost the entire family has been believers. And I, I, the impact having a, you know, a godly wife and, you know, having daughters that are good mothers, I, I just, man, I've been stunningly blessed. I realize that not all have had that experience. My, my siblings, you know, all are, you know, godly women, love the Lord and have tried to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, there's no way to even calculate the blessing that it is. The beauty of that is that any, well, the beauty and the terror of that is that any given generation can change the trajectory positively or negatively, depending upon, because see, God has no grandchildren. You know, I mean, we can pass on a heritage but every individual person needs to come to the Lord on their own and have that faith that comes from uh, God for themselves. So, uh, Mother's Day can be a challenging, difficult time. If you had a mother that was not what she should have been, uh, man, those who suffer from abandonment kinds of issues, uh, rejection, poor parenting, they may not be a reservoir of happy feelings. Um, and it can be difficult for those who in prior times, I know this last weekend with the ladies, there was, you know, probably several there that for whatever reason had earlier in their lives had gotten involved in an abortion and were just stirred and troubled and maybe troubled by that for an extended period of time. And some of you ladies may have experienced that. You were young, you did whatever you did. And, but every day on Mother's Day, it's, kind of a, it can open the wound and the beauty of God in the gospel is that he loves, he forgives, he separates us from our sin, whatever it is as far as the east is from the west and he wants to put his arms around us and say I love you no matter what has happened. So with the, if your past was sad because of Mother's Day or if your past was glorious because of Mother's Day, either way Jesus says I've got you. I know everything there is to know about you. I love you. Come to me and let me, you know, shower my love and grace and joy upon you. Put on the garment of praise if the enemy is trying to put on a spirit of heaviness. And, and that's something that we need to kind of choose to put on. And for every person, it will be a little different but for all of us, it, the, the remedy is the same. Put on Jesus. Put on that garment of praise because then we acknowledge the good things, we acknowledge the blessings, we acknowledge the joy, and that takes our focus off of the pain and trauma, whatever. It make, makes sense. So to honor the, the God's idea of motherhood is phenomenal. It's a good thing to be reminded of the love of Jesus, to be reminded of the forgiveness of Jesus, the welcome to all who have sinned. Motherhood is not for wimps, though. Motherhood is challenging. N women are wired different than men, regardless of what the college professors and others try to tell us. I mean, women's is are just weird critters, man, and they are different than men. And it's a good thing. 
which is a part of the genius of God's creative, uh, creative genius. You know, if I'm occupied doing something, the house could blow up and I'd never know the difference. You know, Rena and other mothers, boy, I mean, they hear a little sound and they are all over it. You know, I mean, they hear a kid cry or they, you know, we're just, we're made differently and thank God for the difference. And even, you know, God has even placed in nature much of the same thing. You know, you don't want to get between a mother grizzly bear and her cub. Motherhood. You don't want to get between a mother moose and her calf. Well, motherhood. I mean, my horses, if they have a foal, they may be docile and all that kind of stuff, but boy, they know how to lay their ears back and go after another horse trying to bother their baby. Well, mothers, somehow God has injected into his creation this amazing willingness of mothers to sacrifice for their children. It is a great, wonderful gift that God has given us. Men, you know, now men will, you know, uh, you know, good men at least, will defend their families and all that kind of stuff, but it's just a different thing than, than women. You know, recently, fairly recently, I saw a picture, some of you may have seen that of, wasn't I think it was like a mother sage hen or something like that, that a forest fire came through and all they could see was the charred remains of this mother hen, but underneath were the little chicks that had been preserved by her life. You know, motherhood is just an amazing and a wonderful thing. As I, as I get older, I'm realizing increasingly that life is transient. It's brief. Um, you know, generations come and generations go. You know, I'm looking at my family. You know, my parents have gone. Now my older sister is gone. None of the rest of us are getting any younger. You know, I look at Rena's family and see that, man, all, you know, most of that generation uh, is gone. And at the human level, it can seem very, very futile. You know, same old, same old. People come, people live their lives, they die, they move on, and it can seem really like an, uh, just futility. In fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes and several, you know, the, the, the talks about the futility of life. Man, the life cycle comes and goes. Nobody's getting out of here alive. And so at the, the cynical level, we see this treadmill of life with people coming off of it or the conveyor belt of life. But God has a much higher purpose. And however all he views it, he sees our brief time here on earth as profoundly significant. Mothers, you have a stunning, amazing task. And uh, I'd like to look a little bit at that. And there's a scripture that is really not necessarily a Mother's Day scripture, but it's found in Galatians chapter 6. And I want all of us to be able to take freshly a look at it because hopefully it will stir us or challenge us or encourage us. And uh, verses 1 through 5. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. That is a profound statement all by itself. It goes on to say, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Well, wait a minute, which is it? Carry one another's burdens, and in this way fulfill the law of Christ, everyone has to carry his own load. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. And it is a powerful statement of life. He goes on to say, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 
the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, man, mothers, I mean, it, this is one of the great paradoxes of the Christian life, and there are many things, because life, you know, the old philosopher's question, is the, is the glass half full or is it half empty? And the answer is yes. Which way are we going to focus? See, that's the challenge of every believer. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Both are there. Which are we going to focus on? And we can spend our whole lives in anger and bitterness and wrath and animosity and everybody is out to get me and we can spend our whole lives looking at the negative side of life because there's plenty out there to see, man. You have to be a complete moron not to see the difficulties of life out there. But on the other hand, there are great, wonderful, and glorious things in this life and we have to make a decision daily, oftentimes many times a day, as to how we're going to view it. Are we going to view it as though everybody's out to get us? Are we going to view it as one round of disappointment after another? Or are we going to view it as God has a role, God has a purpose, and how do I move through life with a positive frame of reference? That's really a day-by-day -day challenge. Every human being on earth faces it. But as believers, we have the word of God giving us the hope and the promise to tell us how to do that. And, but we need to practice it. Like any kind of activity, it takes practice or we will fall into our old same negative patterns. It's a, it's a decision of life. So we fulfill the law of Christ by carrying other per people's loads. This speaks about our human role in life. And, and our, our role in life in some large measure is to serve other people. It is in serving that we are blessed. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We're not to think more lowly of ourselves. As people, the scripture teaches us, I think, that we are, on the one hand, worthless. You know, I mean, the sin nature is worse than merely worthless. It's actually on the negative side of the scale. But the other side of that is that we are of inestimable value to God. We are the only one like us. He loves us. He died on the cross to save us. We are of profound value. And we need to hold that tension. On the one hand, the minute we start thinking we're really somebody, you know, God says, you're nothing. The minute we start to think we're nothing, Jesus reached out and says, you are everything to me. You are my daughter. You are my son. I gave up all the riches of heaven for you because you are of inestimable worth. And it's just, it's the interesting paradox of the gospel. Most of us probably have grown up on kind of at least a lot of the negative side of that. You never work hard enough, you're never smart enough, you never study enough, you never do good enough. How many of you have wrestled with that throughout your lives that you never quite measure up? One. You know, because I was asking kind of for a vote here because I want other people to be able to see. You know, I, challenge, I struggle with that. You know, because the world, to try to do good alone or, to, or to, to be good enough is sort of like dipping out the ocean with a thimble. You're never done. There's always room for improvement, all that kind of stuff. Now, the other side of that, for those who grew up on the other hand, oh, you're wonderful, oh, you're the best, you're the greatest, whatever. You know, everybody that can sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star thinks that they ought to be the next rock star, whether they can even carry a tune in a basket. So on both ends of that spectrum is a hazard. God wants us to see both, hold it in a proper tension that we don't let our ego say we're really something. 
but on the other hand, that as a person, we are of great, great, great value, and Jesus loves us, okay? So most mothers daily sacrifice for their children. Man, I can look back over and over and over again. You know, mom always took the, you know, always fed everybody else, and she would take the chicken neck or whatever else was left, you know, and uh, always was fixing, always preparing, always running, spent her life at a trot, man, going to help uh, anybody that needed help. There was always that, always having other people over for dinner, always caring. Yeah, you know, I just, there are a lot of amazing stories, and mothers do that. And it is in serving others that our own needs really are met. Now, that's true of mothers or anybody else. The people that are most miserable are always, always looking out for number one. People that are always looking out for themselves are never happy. People that are always looking out for others are almost always happy. Not Happy is not the best term. Maybe it's better would be joy. Happy has to do with happenstance or events. You know, we can be happy if things are going our way. We're unhappy if they're not. But joy is a deeper sense that says, look, God is God, and he is taking care of me, and I know where I end up. And, you know, we there's that sense that joy is possible, and we need to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You, you, and uh, people that are looking out for others are way more content. They enjoy life because they see others are hurting. Man, I tell you, I've been through some pain. You know, uh, emotionally, physically, and all the rest of it. I don't think much of it. I just soon not have it. Hope I don't have any more, though I suppose I will at some point. But man, I do not have to look very far at all to say, wow, I have had it made. You know, I mean, I look out over this congregation and see the things that you have had to face. That's the things that I know about. And everybody has it tough. But when you're looking out for and you're concerned about other people, your, your focus comes off of you and you're able to have a heart of gratitude that says, wow, if I can help lift somebody else's load, I should do that. You know, there's a difference in life between those who are giving and those who are taking, and those who are taking are never satisfied. Those who are giving have an entirely different mindset. That's what we are to have, you know. Meet the needs, carry the burdens of one another, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And in fulfilling the law of Christ, our own baskets get filled. We ourselves have a, a better outlook. Yet, in life, each one must carry his own load. Now, this is a challenging statement because they're both in the same little, you know, paragraph in Scripture. So, see, some people so desire to carry other people's burdens that they enable others to become flakes. Flakes is the Greek word for uh, those unable or unwilling to take care, you know, personal responsibility. Often the term snow is added to it uh, for those particularly inept or incapable of doing anything for themselves. But the, the desire to help oftentimes can produce a dependence that is unhealthy and people that are takers will take all that we have. <clears throat> you know, uh, as, as I look back over my life in ministry, uh, we have experienced, of course, a lot of stuff. And the people that we have probably poured ourselves into more than anybody over the years are those who never get their bucket full. And no matter what you pour into it, it just leaks out. I, we have spent years ministering to some or whatever and got out of the way, do you know, and then have them come up at some point and say, well, I'm just not being fed. 
or whatever, you know. And, you know, just, it, it's an amazing thing of life. So the message here is don't quit carrying other people's burdens. Keep doing that. And yet, at the same time, everybody has to step up and carry their own burden. And we need both messages. The message to us is both be always reaching out to help, but at the same time, cowboy up, step up, do your job, you know, get her done, make it happen, and don't be waiting on somebody else to, to satisfy you. And both of those are held in tension, both profoundly true. It requires the Spirit of God to give us that wisdom and discernment about which is which at which time. Because we need to do that. See, we should attempt to do everything we can to help others. We need to realize at the same time we cannot control others. And there is a challenge. Now, children, I mean, there's a time when children need to be controlled. They need to know what no means. You know, don't touch that means don't touch that. Whatever it requires to get them to understand that, that's what needs to be done to get them to understand it. If people never develop self-control, they will ultimately have to be controlled by others. You know, whether, you know, I've had enough of this, I... You know, my mom makes me clean, make my bed, you know, makes me pick up, dad, you know, dad is making me work. I'm going to join the army, you know. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, let me know how your drill sergeant does with that, you know. Uh, so people who don't learn personal responsibility, many of them never get it, and somehow they're able to flit through, but others end up having to be controlled by the military, by the police, by jail, by whatever, because you can't have irresponsible people just running amok entirely forever. In other words, personal responsibility is, is critical. We need to help, but we cannot just control somebody else unless we've been given all that authority. You know, God himself seems to be, seems to have put himself, if you will, in that situation. You know, the cynic says... If God is God, he can't be good. If God is good, he can't be God. Now that makes logical sense if you look at the world of evil and say, well, look, if God is really good, why doesn't he stop all evil? You know, if God really has all power, why doesn't he stop all evil? And if he's good, you know, say, so all these things, but that is missing the point because God has given us the ability to choose. We are created in the image of God and we can make stupid decisions, we can make bad decisions, we can make harmful decisions. How all God sorts that out, we are told in Scripture that there is an ultimate day of judgment. God is a just God. Nobody is going to fall through the cracks, you know, and get blessings at God's hand, even though they were wicked and rebellious and all that. On the other hand, nobody's going to break into heaven and ought not to be there. I mean, God is going to ultimately take care of it. But while we are in this world, there is evil abundant everywhere. And God seems to have allowed that in his grace and mercy in order for us to have free will. God could completely control us. He could just mend it. This is the way it is. You are a robot. You will worship me. And he could just say four times a day. I mean, God could very easily just go, okay, it's nine o'clock. You're all on your face before me worshiping and saying hallelujah for Jesus. He could have created the world that way. He was the creator, is the creator. But he has allowed us to choose. And in that allowance of choosing... The enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil make bad decisions, and we live in a broken and a fallen world because of that. One of the great intellectual challenges uh, of the faith is why does God allow evil? And I believe it is, I don't know of any better explanation than just that he created us in his own image and we have the right to choose who we will follow. 
there is a, a not a poem actually, but kind of a, an ex set of expressions that I encountered sometime that really I think illustrates this from the standpoint of motherhood. And uh, it's called Reflections of a Mother, and I, th I, I don't even know where it came from. But it reflects this business of carrying one another's burdens, and yet everyone must carry his own burden. And so think about that scripture as, we, as I read down this. It says, I gave you life, but I cannot live it for you. I can teach you things, but I can't make you learn. I can give you directions, but I cannot be there to lead you. I can allow you freedom, but I cannot account for it. I can take you to church, but I cannot make you believe. I can teach you right from wrong, but I cannot always decide for you. I can buy you beautiful clothes, but I cannot make you beautiful inside. I can offer you advice, but I cannot accept it for you. I can give you love, but I can't force it upon you. I can teach you to share, but I cannot make you unselfish. I can teach you respect, but I cannot force you to show honor. I can advise you about friends, but cannot choose them for you. I can advise you about sex, but I cannot keep you pure. I can tell you the facts of life, but I can't build your reputation. I can tell you about drink, but I can't say no for you. I can warn you about drugs, but I can't prevent you from using them. I can tell you about lofty goals, but I can't achieve them for you. I can teach you about kindness, but I can't force you to be gracious. I can warn you about sins, but I cannot make you moral. I can love you as a child, but I cannot place you in God's family. I can pray for you, but I cannot make you walk with God. I can teach you about Jesus, but I cannot make Jesus your Lord. I can tell you how to live, but I cannot give you eternal life. See, we are responsible for others in our world <coughs> to a point. Mothers, you have a phenomenal, phenomenal responsibility. You have more influence than perhaps any other person in the world and yet you are not and cannot be God. You know, tensions rise in our lives when we confuse our role with God's. Boy, as I look over my life and work in ministry, I just, I, I mean, I need to hear that. I need to hear it regularly. Because... You know, whenever we think that we have to control someone else, we get all bound up, man. We can watch the news and think we got to fix things in Afghanistan. You know? I mean, we can take upon us all kinds of burdens, but we can bring it right down where we live to our own children or wherever and have the idea that I've got to fix this. And when we take that burden, it is a burden we can't carry because we can't do it. So mothers, you know, those of you that have children, those of you that have grandchildren, let's do what we can, but somehow also let us relax and let God be God. You know, let God worry about it. He's going to be up all night anyway, you know. When I think I must fix others, I get agitated, I get stressed. You know, and, and when that happens, I can neglect what I should do while stewing about what I can't do. You ever, any of you ever face that? Now, there's a final message in this passage that I think also is significant, and that is just the message of hope. And that is, let us not become weary in doing good. 
for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. So mothers, grandmothers, all of the rest of us as we go through life, this message is for all, don't give up hope. Let's do what we can. Let's do what we should. Let's carry our own burden. Let's do everything we can to carry the burden of others while not making them dependent, you know. Let's carry our load, carry the load of others, and let's keep on doing it because God tells us in the fullness of time we will have a harvest. You know, the King James says, do good to all men, especially to them of the household of faith, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Well, let's not faint. Now, there is a weariness that comes in doing good. You know, as has been expressed already, there are those things that we wish we didn't, you know, we really do not want to make this call to do this thing or whatever, so we all face that some, and there is a certain weariness in doing well, even as there is a certain weariness in doing evil. You know, there's a certain weariness that comes from life. That's why we speak of people who have died having eternal rest, which may be a misnomer in the case of many. You know, but the point that is crucial is that we are to not give up. We are not to quit doing well. Look, <clears throat> if a person decides on a Sunday morning how they're feeling, whether or not they want to go to church, if you're like me, there's about 75 or 90 percent of the time, who feels like it? I mean, who feels like helping out somebody else? I mean, come on. Who does that? You know, who feels like getting out and weeding the gardener? You know, there's a lot of stuff that requires. It's not, but the, the, the admonition is don't be weary in doing well, doing good. Because there is a harvest if we don't give up. Mothers, sometimes it is a thankless job. Often you wonder, man, am I making any difference in the world here? Believe me, as a pastor, often I think, man, maybe I just need to get a real job, you know? I mean, what am I doing here? Uh, nobody cares. Everybody's, you know, doing something else. You know, I mean, have you felt that in whatever it is that you do? Yeah, why am I even doing this fool thing, you know? And we need to be given the message of hope, the message of joy, the message of let's put on the garment of praise, because we have a spirit of heaviness. How do we get out of that? We do that by focusing on others, by carrying one another's burdens, carrying our own, but carrying other people's burdens. And when we begin to get into the lifestyle of serving God by serving others, that's where the juice and the joy of life comes. Are you having a little lack of enthusiasm in your Christian walk? Have you become inwardly pointed over the time? Have you begun to think of how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, what do I want, what do I need? See, that puts us on a downward spiral. I get there. Man, I get there from time to time, as you're tempted to do too. But it is a downward spiral that the world, the flesh, and the devil kill us with and we need to take the step that the scripture has highlighted this morning mothers be not weary fathers be not weary in well-doing brothers sisters children of God let's serve God by serving others and uh, thus fulfill the law of Christ and thus fulfill even our own satisfaction in life well, let's pray, should we? And then you got a song? Good deal. Lord, this morning as we've gathered in this place, Lord, I, I pray that you would cause your word to freshly land <clears throat> in our hearts and help us to see the difference between a life of fruitfulness and joy 
in the midst of the world's traumas and troubles and problems and help us to reflect your glory and help us to carry the load of other people and help us also to have the desire to carry our own load in Jesus name amen thank you for watching for questions on today's video please reach out to us at www.flatheadecclesia.org